I'm getting messages here saying my quality is poor, but we'll see what happens there. All right. So good morning. Welcome. Here we are. Uh, compressor control. I hope you guys can see it on the screen there. Uh, nice little IOM here. I always like to talk about specific machinery. It's always nice to get a good understanding of how this stuff works. So compressor control is something that most of us will probably deal with at some point in time, whether it's, uh, you know, pulling vibration switches so that the uh, mill rates can come in there and do the repairs or whatever it is, but we're going to look at uh, all things compressor today. Okay, everyone's looking at the screen. Yes. That's good to go. Okay, perfect. So objectives here for this ILM. Uh, terms related to reciprocating compressors, strategies for reciprocating compressors, problems with reciprocating compressors, and then the same thing with centrifugal compressors. So terms, strategies, and problems. So we'll look at two different styles of compressors today, uh, the most common uh, ones that we see out there in industry, and get a good handle on how they work. So we look at two types. Uh, first. Uh, first type we'll look at is positive displacement type pumps, which is what a, a reciprocating compressor is. And then we'll look at a dynamic style compressor, which is another word for a centrifugal uh, pump. So we'll look at them in two separate sections. Okay, so the single acting reciprocating pump or any recipro reciprocating compressor. Uh, works on a piston reciprocating back and forth inside of, inside of the cylinder. Uh, and they call these positive displacement pumps because every stroke of that cylinder uh, displaces a set volume of the, the cylinder based on the, the stroke length and the cylinder size. So we call these positive displacement because every time they make a stroke, they displace uh, a positive amount of volume. Pretty straightforward machines here. We'll look at this single acting one here uh, first. Uh, this isn't any different than a, a, a gas engine, for example, would operate on this exact same uh, principle as this. As the, as the piston uh, works through its cycle and pulls down, the suction valves open, allow, allowing air into the cylinder. And then as it makes its turn and starts coming back up again, uh, the suction valves will close and the discharge valves will open as the pressure builds with the stroke uh, compressing the, the gas on its, upwards, on its upward stroke. And that's really basically how it works. So it's a pretty simple, uh, pretty simple machine. So a single acting uh, reciprocating compressor uses one side of the piston. As you can see here, we draw air in and then we pump it back out. We're just, we're just using the volume on the top side of the piston. Leads us into a double acting uh, reciprocating uh, compressor, which uses both sides of the piston. So it'll compress on this side and it will also compress on this side. And it's got a few more pieces in it, of course, uh, two sets of valves, one for each end, um, a bunch of different components that are in here that we should probably become familiar with. So the piston is connected uh, to the crankshaft by the connecting rod. Uh, through what's called a crosshead, uh, which sits inside of some guides here, uh, connected to a stem that goes through packings and ultimately connects to the piston here. So uh, this guy right here is called the crosshead, and its purpose is to connect the connecting rod to the piston. And this is our connecting rod, of course, and then our piston way, way over here. Compressors uh, can be simple single stage compressors that we probably have in our garages that have just one cylinder and it moves up and down and builds pressure in our tank for us. Uh, industrially, typically you'll have multi-stage compressors where the pressure uh, increases as we go through the different stages. Um, and that's most, most common in industry. Uh, there's very few single stage compressors that are used in, in industry. So almost all of them are multi-stage. One of the things that we have to add in once we start talking about multi-stage compressors is a device called an intercooler that is inserted in between the different stages uh, of 
a compressor and these intercoolers are used to reduce the temperature and decrease the power required for compression on the next stage. So as we compress the gas, heat builds up in that gas. So we bring it through the intercooler that reduces the temperature uh, in it, which reduces uh, the amount of power that it's going to take for the second stage to recompress it again. Uh, what was I going to say about that? I can't remember. I had something else to say. Uh, much like a diesel, I guess, uh, if you understand the, the, the physics behind a diesel engine, um, it fires basically just on compression, whereas a gas engine will have a spark plug that will uh, ignite the gas, compressed gas and air mixture at the top of the at the top of the stroke. A diesel engine doesn't do that. It, it has such a tight compression volume at the top that it compresses the gas so much that the temperature builds uh, so high that it actually ignites on its own. So that's kind of the physics behind what's going on inside the cylinder, uh, and that's why we require uh, an intercooler between stages. So here's a little chart that shows a sequence of action of what happens uh, as a reciprocating compressor goes through its stroke cycle. And uh, you can kind of walk through this uh, thing as, as it goes on by itself. But basically what, what we can look at is the, uh, the pressure uh, versus the cylinder volume, which is a function of the stroke, the piston going up and down. Uh, in, the, in the cylinder. So um, being able to understand this graph is something that you uh, that you need to understand uh, as, as we go through this here. So what's happening here is we have uh, high pressure up here, so discharge pressure, suction pressure down here, low stroke, big stroke, and what happens. So as our pressure uh, at the top here, our discharge pressure, uh, this would be fully compressed at this point here. Uh, and then intake valve would then open, the piston would start coming down, drawing uh, fresh gas into the cylinder, uh, decreasing the pressure inside the cylinder as the piston comes down. Then that piston, uh, as that piston uh, opens up all the way, it fills the cylinder completely with gas uh, as it goes through this stroke. And it's a very low pressure in the cylinder at this point because it's just pulling the gas in. And then that's point A here, the compression stroke will start, the piston will start moving up, the discharge valve uh, will start to uh, open as we get up on towards point B here. At this point here would be fully compressed, the discharge valve would open, and then it would allow the compressed gas out, and the cycle starts again, low pressure, piston coming down, and then building pressure as the piston comes up, and then finally discharging, and that's what's described uh, in the little diagram here on the side. Uh, a characteristic of a reciprocating compressor is that it is essentially a variable pressure machine with a relatively constant flow. Um, and the reason that this is mentioned in the note box in the ILM, because this is the opposite of the way a, a centrifugal compressor works. A centrifugal compressor is a flow machine with a relatively constant pressure. So that's something to pay attention to as we uh, look at the two different types of compressors here. So uh, Luno says that there's three self-test answers on this on this page in the ILM uh, and there's a section that describes uh, the operation of, of the compressor as it goes through a cycle. Okay so that's basic uh, reciprocating compressor stuff uh, then we start talking objective two here which are control strategies for running a reciprocating compressor. So again they start out a simple control strategy building up to the more complicated control strategies as we move through uh, the descriptions of these strategies in the next few slides here. Okay, on off control. Um, as you read through your ILMs, do pay attention to um, the diagrams of the control schemes uh, so that you can familiarize yourself with the control elements that are in place for the different strategies. Um, they start out relatively simple as we have here, and of course they will build more and more complex. Um, but you should be able to identify uh, the control scheme based on the hardware uh, that is shown in the diagrams here. So on-off control, 
uh, very primitive. Uh, this is exactly like your garage compressor. Uh, super, super simple. It uses pressure switches to turn it off and on at preset values. Nothing exciting here. The receiver pressure gets low, our compressor turns on, starts compressing. Once the pressure switch uh, is satisfied, the high pressure switch is satisfied, it opens the contacts on the motor and it stops compressing. Once the pressure drops again, then contacts close and then the motor starts again and away we go. So pretty, pretty straightforward. There's no other no other mechanisms on here, just the two pressure switches. And you'll see that the uh, pressure is controlled just by a regulator, so there's not really any uh, complicated scheme here. Next style of uh, strategy for a recip compressor here is called constant speed unloading. And constant speed unloading, I know, you know okay, I do show a couple of pictures here. Um, unloading introduces a block. Um, mechanical component here which contains some valves uh, inside some chambers and it's not a great uh, diagram here necessarily but uh, using this component here called an unloader uh, allows us to make a mechanical adjustment that varies the compressed volume so as you um, read through the ILM I'm not sure if my next slide shows this or not but, but the uh, constant speed unloading is a mechanical adjustment that basically varies the compressed volume. So by varying the size of that uh, uh, that set volume that it, that it usually has. So it's not just the cylinder volume anymore. It takes into consideration some of the space and what we'll call the, the head, I guess, of it, which uh, changes the uh, compression volume. And by changing the compression volume, it can increase or decrease the maximum pressure that it generates. So it does this by either varying the suction valve opening or the clearance pocket size. So hopefully the next diagram will have a, a picture of this motor so I can show you what these uh, components look like. So the big idea here with this unloader as the name kind of leads you to believe is it, it takes some of the uh, load off of a compressor when it's starting. I don't know if you've had any experience uh, with it, but a compressor that's fully, fully charged up uh, and turned off. When you go to start it up again, if there's full pressure on the on the face of that piston, well, that takes a lot of effort for that motor to to start moving that piston back and forth. So if we can find a way to release the pressure uh, on the face of that piston during startup, it makes starting up a lot easier. It's like opening up. Uh, you could open up a valve on the cylinder, for example, uh, and there would be no pressure buildup. The piston would move freely back and forth. It's like taking the spark plug out of your car. Uh, you put the spark plug back in, and then, of course, it builds up pressure. Uh, it's the same kind of idea here when we're talking about the, using the unloader. The idea is to make it easier to, uh, to start or to reduce the capacity. So let's hopefully look at what it looks like here. Okay, so suction valve unloading. Uh, we're talking about the uh, either suction valve opening or clearance pocket size here. So suction valve unloading here basically leaves the suction valves open so no pressure builds. And this allows for a variable loading uh, by combining the use of the suction valve. So if I have my suction valves here, and I can open them or, or close them as we want. So if they're both uh, both open, of course, I can, I can create no no pressure whatsoever right the piston is going to go back and forth it's just going to suck air out and in and in out and in and out and in and out and in and out if i close one of them i can get 50 percent capacity and if i close both of them i'll get 100 percent capacity so that's kind of the concept of suction valve unloading it's using the valves just to it's like pulling out a spark plug okay the next one here is called step clearance unloading that we mentioned earlier and it's basic uh, method of operation here, it varies the compressed volume allowing the gas to expand back into the cylinder. So we have these little things called clearance pockets. They're hiding behind the valves here basically in their auxiliary chambers on top of the compressed area of the piston. So normally we'd have the compressed area of the piston in this white area which would uh, create a certain pressure at that stroke. If I suddenly opened up this valve some of that pressure would go into, into here. Obviously, the volume gets larger, so the pressure is going to drop. So the concept of uh, clearance, uh, step clearance unloading is by opening a combination of these chambers, I can get different load uh, 
load variable. So here, if I close all the chambers, I get full load. I'm just compressing within the, the white area here. Open one chamber, I get three quarters load. Open three chambers, I get one quarter load. Open two chambers, I get half load. And open all the, chamber, open all the chambers and I get no load. So um, um, another relatively straightforward uh, method of, of uh, controlling the pressure for startup. K5 step unloading here uh, kind of builds on both of the previous methods here. Um, it's a combination of suction valves and pocket size here. So we have the suction valves uh, just as we had here. They're both closed at this point in time, so they're loaded. Here I have a uh, clearance pocket connected to an unloader uh, on, a, on a solenoid type valve here. And again, this opens and closes, changing the volume uh, th that can be compressed by the piston. Uh, so it can use the same uh, elements uh, of, of the uh, step clearance unloading, and it also uses the elements of the variable uh, valve openings. Okay, this is, uh, what's this one here? Variable five-step unloading, yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearance pocket unloaded, blah, blah, blah. Uh, here's a variable clearance unloader. So this one here has uh, a positioner, I guess you could say, I guess uh, an actuator, hydraulic actuator, it has a certain volume and a certain stroke. So this one here, rather than being an open or closed type of situation that we had uh, here with this type of unloader, we have the option here now to make this uh, variable size. So it can, its stroke length can be anywhere from here to all the way back. And by varying the size um, using the stroke of the, um, the uh, position or the actuator here, we can make that size variable. So variable clearance just means that we vary the size of this pocket. Clip it along here through the PowerPoint today. Okay, recirculation, another type of control. So where are we back here? We looked at uh, on off, constant speed unloading. So constant speed, all of the previous examples that we looked at opening the valves and varying that pocket size. Uh, the idea is that we're still running at a constant speed. All we're doing is we're increasing or decreasing the volume, which increases or decreases the pressure. And remember we said way back here, uh, it's variable pressure, but a relatively constant flow which is attached basically to the speed. So the third strategy we're gonna look at here is uh, recirculating and then we'll look at speed control. So here's recirculation. Recirculation, again, pretty self-explanatory here. It recirculates the gas back to the suction side. So you see we have a line after our uh, discharge uh, valve here that is recirculating it back to the beginning. So it comes out, goes around and comes back here. Uh, downside, of course, to this here is it's not as efficient um, as it wastes power when it goes through this recompressing all the time, right? It's compressing the same gas over and over again, so it's no longer uh, as efficient. Other names for this style of control are known uh, as spillback or recycle control. So recycle, recirculation, spillback. Uh, again, all pretty simple uh, control methods at this point here. Last but not least, uh, for strategies for recep are speed controls. So this is a little bit more of an elaborate uh, drawing that we show here. Um, speed control is a split range selective control strategy. Oh my God, we're putting a whole bunch of these things that we've learned together now. Um, here we have our selective control strategy here. We've got two transmitters, we've got one valve uh, affected by two measured variables. So here we have our, our split range action going on here. So again, being able to identify this based on the hardware that you see in the diagram is relatively important. So speed control, as the name would imply, varies the speed of the prime mover. The prime mover means motor with a governor or a VFD. Uh, VFTs I can talk to you about, governors I don't know that much about. Um, but this is the way speed control works. Um, again, 
Uh, machines that are out in the field where there's less electricity will generally use governors. Uh, we are in a plant where we've got lots of electricity, we're generally going to use a, a VFD. All right, so that is uh, different strategies for resip. And I think next slide we start talking about problems with resip controllers, what things can go wrong. Oh, okay, so here's a here's a big diagram showing you uh, your average compressor kind of scheme here. It's a little bit complicated to, to look at this diagram uh, without anything beside it, but uh, the idea in the ILM here is to um, look at the different pieces of equipment and define what the function of that equipment is. So on pages uh, 15 and 16, uh, there's a table and it'll tell you what the pulsation bottle does, um, what the intercooler does, what the aftercooler does, uh, all of these different uh, all of these different features here. But it's good for you to uh, walk through the process here. And, and see kind of what happens. So it's uh, it's a good overview of what the process looks like. Uh, you'll notice that this one here has flare valves and a flare, so we're not talking about compressing uh, air here, we're talking about compressing natural gas. Okay, so there are problems with reciprocating compressors and we have to be uh, aware of them because the controls that we look after are there to identify any of these problems. So we will look at over or under pressurization, overheating, lots of lubrication, vibration, and rod monitoring. So different points in the reciprocating compressor that we will focus our attention to in terms of in terms of potential issues that we uh, might see. It says details on page 18 on the ILM, but I think that has changed. Where are we here? Oh, no, it's still page 18. So the pages 18 and a few pages after that, we'll describe these in a little bit more detail, but I think I do also. So let's see. No, I skip all of these. So that's kind of lame. Do I really? All right. Anyhow, let's move on. So looking at our reciprocating compressor here, we got a crankshaft again, we've got our connecting rod here, we've got the crosshead. This is a little bit more of a realistic diagram uh, than we had seen initially. So this crosshead here has a little bit of movement in it. So that's something to be aware of. It's sliding back and forth. So there's areas there for friction. Uh, we've got an oil wiper in here, we got a piston rod, all these wonderful uh, different different components. So we have to monitor this. There's all kinds of mechanical play in here. There's uh, opportunities for uh, measuring pressure. There's opportunities for measuring vibration and heat and all kinds of different things. But um, most critically uh, in a reciprocating compressor is, is monitoring the rod. And when we're talking about monitoring the rod, we're talking about the mechanical connection between the crankshaft and the piston, whether it's the connecting rod or the piston rod. Uh, most of the stuff we'll talk about are dealing with uh, the crosshead and the connecting rod. Okay, so rod monitoring issues. Uh, this is why we uh, have lots of our control mechanisms on the compressor, vibration monitoring, temperature monitoring, pressure monitoring. Uh, we use these measurements to identify some of the issues that can be associated uh, with rod monitoring. So some terms associated with rod monitoring uh, include rod drop uh, and that is the situation where the piston rings have worn and the rod drops lower than spec in a horizontal compressor so if we look at our diagram here um, this is a horizontal compressor and if our piston rings wear out that that's uh, that's what we call rod drop okay second issue here that we talk about is called rod loading which is stress on the rod from differential pressure across the piston and the driving force. So this is usually over, overcome with some type of an unloading mechanism that we discussed earlier. And then the third uh, major problem here that we look at in terms of rod monitoring is something called rod reversal, uh, which is defined as the result of compression and tension loads at the crosshead pin. And again, I'm not a... Uh, super compressor guru here but uh, it's it has to do with what happens 
uh, with the stresses placed on the crosshead. So again, general understanding of uh, you know what are some potential issues with a reciprocating compressor here. So most of the time, uh, issues are going to be related to uh, pressure, temperature, uh, vibration, loss of lubrication, and the physical things that come along with that. Once we lose lube oil, for example, example uh, temperatures are going to start to rise. Uh, things are going to start wearing out. Pressures are going to start dropping because the rings are going to wear out and things like that. So they're very associated together. Um, so a lot of things that we need to look at. Okay, reciprocating safety, uh, talking about shutdowns and uh, overall supervisory type control for a reciprocating compressor. So there's four classes of shutdowns that we associate with reciprocating compressors uh, and they're classed. So just like we have uh, hazardous location classifications, we have safety shutdown classifications for uh, compressors, so reciprocating compressors. And particular. <clears throat> so class A, always armed, continuously monitored. So these are uh, usually your, your vibration controls, your temperature controls, pressure controls, all that kind of good stuff. But you'll see as we walk through the startup and shutdown process, uh, different classes come into play at different times in the process. So uh, you can't have all your uh, Class A's operating before the compressor's running, for example. So that's something to look at as we as we talk about, or as you read about, I guess, through these classes in the ILM. So Class A shutdown, always armed, continuously monitored. Class capital B, there's differentiation between capital and lowercase here, armed after running, and Class B timer expires. And this will make sense uh, as you read through, let's see, after, after you read through the uh, startup procedures uh, in the next few pages. Class little b here, armed after running, and the class b timer expires. And you'll see where these timers are, are used uh, in the next couple of pages of the ILM. Class c is armed when the PV is within its operating uh, limits. So let me just see what we got going on here. Yeah. Uh, the ILM on page 22 describes each of these in a little bit uh, more detail, but basically as you're running through uh, the process of starting and, shut, and shutting down a compressor, different conditions apply. Uh, obviously, uh, we step back and we looked at the process of starting the compressor, what happens. There's different permissives and interlocks that have to be in place in order for it to make its way through its uh, startup procedure, and that's what we're going to look at here next. Okay, so compressor startup for a reciprocating compressor is basically a, a five-step process. So operator initiates the start, aka press the start button. Uh, at that point, we'll get pre-lube in the compressor. So our lube, uh, our lube skin will fire up. It'll start pumping oil into the compressor to get everything good. Uh, there will be a pressure switch attached to the um, to the pre-lube system, and once a certain amount of pre-lube pressure is achieved then we get a permissive and that's tied to one of those class uh, shutdowns that we talked about earlier and I can't off the top of my head tell you which one it is but it is so class A shutdown so it will happen if I don't have compressor, compressor lube oil so it has to be above a minimum level or the compressor is just not going to start. So once that's fulfilled, the engine will crank, uh, crank, 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 and then it'll fire up and then the engine will uh, go through its warm up process. And then once the uh, engine is all warmed up, then we'll generally start loading uh, the compressor. Ooh, this is a painful one. So this is the, uh, table that I was uh, hoping that was here uh, that walks you through the class uh, shutdowns and how they fall into line uh, during the during the startup process. So again, startup sequence is a five part sequence, pressing the start button, pre-lubing, cranking, ignition, and engine warm up. And you'll see, uh, I'm not going to read this out for you because uh, you guys I'm sure can read uh, very well, but this works in those uh, shutdowns and how they fit into the control scheme. 
Okay, once it's uh, once it's started, we can start to load it up. So there's a, a sequence for loading it up as well. And I'm not going to get into the uh, super details here, but a three-step process here. So first step, acceleration to minimum load speed. So you bring the compressor up a little bit. Then you initiate uh, you initiate loading, which generally means uh, closing a closing a valve somewhere. And then once you get the balance between your your valves and you're creating pressure, we we call that online. And then we can start increasing the speed if we want to increasing the speed or uh, switch it into automatic and let it start doing its own little thing. So that's reciprocating compressors 101. Okay, so what do we got? What the heck is this? Uh, shut down. Where does this come from? Okay, so this is the unloading and shutdown procedure. Uh, again, I'm not going to walk you through this step by step. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. So shut down the motor, turn down all the control systems, open valves as required, la -da 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 -da, the motor stops. And after the motor stops, we have a post-loop cycle that runs for a certain amount of time uh, before it finally eventually stop, uh, stops. That's under normal circumstances. Uh, different, of course, when you have an emergency situation here. So different process, be familiar with the process uh, of a normal stop and an emergency stop. This leads us to centrifugal compressors. So uh, same but different as we go through the next bunch of slides describing the operation of a centrifugal compressor, control strategies associated with a centrifugal compressor and issues uh, with centrifugal compressors. So here is the old centrifugal compressor here. Um, sucks in air, flings it against the side walls here. So it comes in, increases in velocity at the center here. And then as it gets flung out here, the velocity uh, decreases and it increases the pressure. And then the pressure comes out the end of uh, pump. We call this a dynamic compressor because it has to do with changing the kinetic energy of the gas and it and it varies with speed versus a positive displacement pump that we talked about or the compressor that we talked about uh, previously uh, with a reciprocating compressor. So basic operation here, it's a dynamic compressor that converts velocity into pressure using the diffuser and the diffuser is basically the housing of the compressor and by flinging uh, the gas from the center of the Ferris wheel uh, to the outside, it, it decreases in velocity and increases in pressure. And that's the basic uh, element of a centrifugal, com centrifugal compressor. And those of you that are old enough to remember uh, the playground uh, merry-go-rounds, it's kind of kind of the same idea, the physics that throw you off the side of the thing. Okay, uh, just like reciprocating compressors, uh, centrifugal comp or, yeah, centrifugal compressors can also be multi-stage. Um, this is a nice diagram because it shows you how heat builds up through the different stages. Uh, each day that stage uh, compresses and with that compression builds a little bit more heat. And you see we're getting more and more heat generated as we go through the different stages. This is why we introduce again, just like we did in Recep, uh, intercoolers. Uh, between the stages and those intercoolers there are of course there to reduce the heat generated in between the stages and also to make it easier for the following stage to recompress uh, the gas from a, from a previous stage. Okay, compression ratio uh, in, a, in a centrifugal compressor here is a ratio of the absolute suction pressure to the absolute discharge pressure. It's not tricky math. Uh, at all, but it's uh, discharge pressure over suction pressure. Uh, insert your numbers. Uh, insert your numbers here. You may be asked to do some uh, simple math here, saying if my discharge pressure is um, 800 kPa and I got X number of stages, what is my suction pressure or something like that? Nothing very, nothing very tricky here. 
Okay, at a given speed, uh, here's the here's the note that uh, is the opposite of the one that we looked at for reciprocating compressors here. So at a given speed, a centrifugal compressor is a relatively constant pressure variable flow, whereas again, recip was the opposite of that. What the hell have I done here? Issues. So with a centrifugal compressor, we have something called surged. Uh, does anyone know what surge is? This is kind of set up for classroom where I can pick on somebody, but I don't really have anyone to pick on. So no volunteers. What is surge? Surge is a condition that occurs when the discharge pressure exceeds the internal pressure, creating a backwards flow in the compressor. Surge is not a good thing in a compressor. You may have been around a compressor that surges and surging compressors are uh, easily identifiable by the surging noises that they make. But that's one of the major problems uh, that we have to look out for with a centrifugal compressor. Another one uh, that they have in the ILM here is a definition of a term called choke or stonewall point that they want you to know about. And the choker stonewall point is the situation that occurs when the velocity exceeds the speed of sound and it happens at high flow and low pressure. And I just let me flip quickly to page 31, see if there's anything else that needs to be said. Uh, when the gas velocity in any part of the compressor reaches the speed of sound, this is said to be the choke or stonewall point choking occurs when the compressor is operating at low discharge pressures and very high flow rates. Not sure exactly of the significance of it, but the more fancy words you know, the better off you will be. Okay, controlling a centrifugal compressor. So capacity control is uh, the basic method, excuse me, that we use for controlling a centrifugal compressor is its capacity control. And we look at three methods of adjusting the capacity of the compressor, suction throttling, guide vane positioning, and speed control. Again, evolutionary as we uh, look at them all here. For some reason, I've got speed control first on this slide. I'm not sure why, um, but again, Look at the diagrams, look at the elements that we're measuring, our control scheme here, and be able to identify uh, what's going on here. So we have a pressure transmitter uh, providing a remote set point to a speed controller, a speed transmitter, and a VSD here. Suction throttling. Oh, look, I got them all just hammered into one slide here. So suction throttling. Suction throttling pressure and flow control. So here's suction throttling inlet gas, so suction line, and our pressure transmitter is varying the opening and closing of the suction valve. So this is why we call it suction throttling. Flow control, looky look, flow transmitter controlling the flow of our suction, aka suction flow control. And last but not least here, guide vane positioning using a pressure transmitter and a protein, uh, pressure controller that adjusts the output to a uh, actuator positioner that changes the angle of the inlet veins. And these inlet veins are the, just like, in, just like the pitch on a propeller of an of a airplane or a helicopter, um, by flattening them out or angling them more, we can get more or less um, airflow going through there. So again, diagrams, Pretty self-explanatory here, suction throttling, flow control, and guide main positioning, and then of course, speed control. All right, let's look at uh, some of the problems that we are addressing here. And the first one is surge control, and one of the big ones with a uh, centrifugal compressor. So again, surge com uh, surging happens when low flow causes a flow reversal and compressed gas rushes back from the discharge to the inlet. That in turn causes a pressure drop in the discharge, which then will reestablish the flow in the right direction until it reverses again. And then the cycle would continue 
uh, would be continually repeated if the search control scheme wasn't implemented. So it's high pressure, then the pressure goes away, then it builds up, and then it goes away, and then it builds up. So that's why we call it surge. So how do we get over that? Two strategies. Something to note up here only happens in centrifugal compressors. I mentioned that already, but there it is. Okay, two strategies to eliminate surge. First is ratio control. So again, diagrams, uh, very important here. How do I know if this is ratio control? Well, a good indicator probably is this little ratio that you see uh, up here. So here we have the pressure differential transmitter between the suction and discharge side. Uh, providing a road set point to a flow transmitter on the suction side and that provides an output and a ratio to the flow out and you can see this is kind of a uh, recirculating type situation here so based on the differential pressure across the compressor as we measure it here the head pressure uh, at the inlet ooh, where the hell is that uh, what the hell am i saying here based on the delta p across the compressor the head pressure at the inlet and surge data so this is the way that they set up that ratio control more important that you uh, understand the strategies here so there you go second one uh backup open loop is that what that stands for i hope it's what it stands for Uh, da, 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 back up, open loop, ratio surge control. Why do they take this out of the ILM? Basic ratio surge control with backup strategy. Okay, so this is off of page 43 here. Um, they changed the wording in here a little bit, but uh, they call this ratio of surge control with backup. And wow, it's got some backup in here. Okay, why do we need this? Why do we even mention this here? Uh, it's in place to cover situations when the surge is oscillating too fast or the regular control is off or fails. So basically this is a bunch of extra equipment added on here as a backup should any of the um, basic these parts this part these parts uh, fail yeah i'm not sure yeah so this open loop backup strategy slowly closes the recycle valve uh, once the compressor starts moving away from surge so more uh, not important to really be able to understand the deeper inner workings of this system here. Just know that it's a uh, more evolved method of handling surge control or the issue of surge. Okay, dedicated surge control system. So off of page 45 here, um, and most of the systems that are actually out there have dedicated surge control systems built into them in the form of this anti-surge controller. Uh, they're integrated into the uh, operating and emergency control systems of the compressor. Uh, and a special note about these uh, controls, uh, particularly the transmitters that we are using to measure the different parameters on the compressor, the surge frequency or the cycle rate uh, for surging can be pretty fast. Uh, it says in the ILM here that it, they can cycle in, you know, one cycle per second, which doesn't sound very fast, but for a compressor, you know, it's pretty fast going rah, 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 kind of thing. So as a result, the measuring devices has have to be fast uh, also. That is really, that's the end already. Man, okay, let's see if this video works and what this video is. For over 50 years, F.S. Elliott's oil-free, centrifugal air and gas compressors have led the industry with a technologically advanced design that delivers reliable, trouble-free... Do you guys see this video? 
Uh, I think we're just looking at your compressor control slide. All right, hang on. I will change a chance vu la screen. Oh, let's see here. Uh, can I pull this off? Uh, window. Da, 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 da. How come? Why is this so why is this so difficult here? So you cannot see my screen right now? Uh it was on for a second there. You had a, a link up for YouTube or something. Oh, you're back. You left yeah, the had, session for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I had a little mal, I had a little malfunction in the junction. All right, let me just, uh, let me see, let's see if I can get this. But yeah, I, I, I could see your, uh, you did have the link up for the YouTube video or whatever for a split second. There. How's that? Yep, you bet. Creation with the lowest cost of ownership. Offering a horsepower range of 250 to 5,000 with up to four stages of compression, our compressors are ideally suited to a broad range of industries. Every aspect of your compressor's performance is developed by our multifaceted regulus control system. This easy-to-use central control system features the most powerful processors in the industry and can be used either remotely or at the site of the unit itself. With the unprecedented control provided by the regular system, a manager can operate one or more compressors at a time while simultaneously achieving the greatest energy saving efficiency possible. Before entering the first compression stage in a multi stage configuration, ambient air or gas must pass through FS Elliott's high efficiency filtration system. From there, an inlet guide vane automatically adjusts itself to changes in system demand regulating the incoming low-velocity air or gas stream as it flows toward the first stage impeller with a pre-swirl effect. As the low-velocity air or gas stream flows into the first stage stainless steel impeller at the inducer, centrifugal force directs its flow to the trailing edge. From there, the accelerated air or gas stream flows from the first stage impeller to a radio diffuser which converts the air's high velocity into static pressure before the heated air enters the scroll casing. To ensure perfect aerodynamics, FS Elliott will custom design both the backward leaning impeller and radio diffuser for your specific application. With each stage of compression, the air or gas temperature rises, pressure increases, and volume decreases. In addition to the impellers and radio diffusers, the rotor assembly consists of a pinion supported by two self-centering tilting or flexure pad journal bearings. Shaft seals on the impellers prevent gearbox oil from contaminating the compression chamber. Powered by a high-speed motor, the pinions and central bowl gear are machined to Agma Quality Class 13. After passing into the scroll casing, the heated air or gas flows through the inner stage piping into the first stage intercooler, causing the moisture to condensate and separate from the lower velocity cooled air. Because FS Elliott intercoolers feature straight through tubes, cleaning is possible rather than costly replacement. As the air travels through the corrosion resistant plenum, the separated condensate is removed from the compressor through a drain valve located at the bottom of the intercooler enclosure. By regulating the discharge of condensate, the drain valve increases the efficiency of the process by preventing unnecessary compressed air loss. Once the condensate is removed, the cooled air exits the inner cooler and flows into the inlet duct for the next stage of compression, during which the entire process is repeated. The compressed air or gas then moves to the after cooler, where it's cooled and any remaining moisture is removed. 
This highly energy efficient process concludes with the delivery of ISO 8573-1 Class 0 certified oil-free air, ready to power a variety of industrial applications. Depending on the number of stages within the configuration, discharge pressure can reach a maximum of 350 PSIG or 23 bar G. Whether your application calls for a hard-working industrial compressor package or an engineered custom design, you can count on FS Elliott to deliver efficient, energy-saving performance, ease of operation, and rugged reliability. How'd you like that? Yeah, that's pretty cool seeing how it all worked. Some good words in there. Here's another one. Check this one out. I can connect with someone like Corey.